And you know, I'm 15 years old, you know, and uh, want to meet chicks, and that wasn't happening in Iran, <laughs> so but anyway, but uh, but I did, did have a high school team there, and one of the things that uh, the team at the school that they call Tron American School, pretty famous back in the day, it was big enough to have uh, four teams, then they had a, an additional team that was a community school that had Iranians and Americans, and so uh, this is in the 70s. So I'm a little older than everyone here, most likely. But uh, you know, I, 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 was, I was a pretty good football player, and they had an all-star game, and I was in it, and I did some pretty cool stuff. And so one of the coaches came up to me and said, hey, you would be good in college. You, you could have the potential to play college football. So that always stuck in my brain. And so I'm like, well, how am I going to get there? My dad's a, an Air Force sergeant. And six, I'm the oldest of six kids. not going to make it. So I said, I'll join the military. So. I would do some hardcore, so I went, I was in the 82nd Airborne as a paratrooper, did that, and then uh, there was a chaplain there in my unit who played at Kansas State, he said, hey, I heard you wanna play football, let me make some phone calls. So I was on my way to Notre Dame to play there, and, uh, but it did, I didn't go. Because <laughs> uh, he knew I was probably, because I had played in four years, I'd probably ride the bench, and so he said, where are you from? I said, Michigan, uh, I was born there, uh, somewhere. And so, uh, uh, he said, well, let me look at the paper, and Eastern Michigan needs some help. They called him, and that's where I went. Played there, I did pretty well. Then went to the Dallas Cowboys, then chased some girl to San Diego. I didn't last very long, we went to the young uh, with the Cowboys, and then went to San Diego, and that, la that relationship lasted about a month. <laughs> and so I was training in Gold's Gym in Venice, uh, not in Venice, but in San Diego, and I'd be friends with this guy who was named Steve Hanaberry, great guy, big, big huge bodybuilder guy. And uh, I said, hey, I'm going up to, Universal Studios to read for this movie called Nightmare on Elm Street, part five. And uh, they played a bigger version of Freddy Krueger or something. They said, hey, I bought you come, maybe you can audition too. And then we'll go train at Venice, you know, Venice Beach, the Gold's Gym there. I said, okay, cool. So I took the day off from work. I had a, my degree was in computer science and uh, I was sit behind a computer staring at code all day, and I, which yeah. I didn't want to do that. It can be maddening. It can be, yes. <laughs> And so um, I took the day off from work and went up there and it, literally the audition was on Hollywood and Vine. You can't get any more Hollywood than that. And the, along the Hollywood Walk of Fame, I could see the Hollywood the sign and we drove up there. I'm like, you know, you know, podunk towns all over the United States and everywhere. So it was so cool to see that. And so we went in, auditioned. He auditioned first and asked me if I wanted to do it. I said, I'll come in. And it was, the director was Stephen Hopkins, who would later be, uh, directed like Ghost in the Darkness and a bunch of pretty cool films. He's like, so Michael, have you seen this Freddy Krueger movies? And I was like, yeah, you know, of course. And then uh, he says, so we need a big guy to give us laugh like Freddy Krueger. <laughs> so I, I let out this big. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. That's and, good. I got and, chills. And then he went like, 
that's fucking awesome. Yeah. Yeah. You got yourself a job. I'm like, uh, well, I, I work at Xerox. Yeah. Yeah. Like, that's all it takes. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. And then, so he said, he said, well, you'll take a few days off. And so I did. It lasted like two weeks. And I've said this when I won the Fuse Fangoria Chainsaw Awards for Bibles of Eyes. Uh, during one of my interviews there, I said, if it wasn't for Robert England and how gracious he was to me, I'd ne probably never become an actor because he was just so nice to me that it really made me want to become an actor because he was like, this is really cool. If there's cool, cool people like that, I want to be involved. And so, you know, that was cool. But um, a funny story about Nightmare on Elm Street, most people don't know, but I played two characters in that film. Do you have the other character? No. Would this be the opening credits? It was. You, you do know. <laughs> um, we cheated. We were just watching. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, yeah, so that I was sitting there like on the last day or so, and the director and the cast director sitting there, and they're like, you know, I can hear the conversation. We need a guy that's a body double for the uh, for the lead, because uh, you know, and for the girl too. We need someone like a muscular, a kind of muscular body, and. Whatever, and I'm standing there, and they kept looking at me, and I'm looking at my car, look at my what, like, <laughs> huh, Michael, um, would you mind doing a love scene for us? I'm like, uh, super buddy, <laughs> right? <laughs> and they're like, no, you know, we want you to get naked with this girl, I'm like, and you're gonna pay me for this? <laughs> so, so that's what happened. So that was kind of cool. So after I did super buddy, I rolled around and. You know, in a bed with about 50, 50 people looking at me, and now like, I want to see a super pretty love scene. I know, <laughs> I, can't, I can't get it out of the brain now. <laughs> but that's kind of how it started. And then from there, I said, you know, I'm thinking, oh, this is easy. You know, I just walked in, I got a couple lines, I got my SAG card, and I was scared shitless. But it was great. And yeah. people don't know that the the light bolt across the super pretty thing wasn't supposed to be there at the beginning. So they put squibs underneath there, and if, when they went off, they caught my shirt on fire, and so they had to put a lightning bolt across. They come up with that to hide the holes. It worked so well, though. It worked yeah. Yeah. And I agree. I agree. So, um, yeah. So I said oh, I could do this. So I moved up from San Diego and got a uh, crappy apartment at some weird dude's uh, place, and slept on the floor and uh, slept in my car a few times too, and then got to the apartment. And, Slept on his floor and uh, started auditioning, and I was terrible. I sucked. Uh, but I said, decided I needed to really, if I wanted to do this, study my ass off. So I did scene study, improv, cold reading, audition technique, theater, everything you can think of. Every night I was studying. I even had my car stolen one night, come back from out of acting class, and my car was stolen. I found it. I found the car. Wow. I, it, was a, it was a yellow IROC. They're not hard to find, you know. And, sure. and, and so I had my my uh, headshots in my back seat. So I went to the, it was in Hollywood, so I went to the Hollywood station and filed for a report. I said, dude, you're never gonna find your car. All right, went back to my apartment and then this, this guy calls the house. Hey dude, are you Michael Belly Smith? And I said, yeah, he goes, hey man, I got your headshots all over the parking lot 7-Eleven in Pasadena, man. Oh. And I'm like, okay, so I got my, my this creepy dude to give you the ride to Pasadena. And there were my headshots. I'm like, well, if my headshots are here, then my car is gonna be here somewhere, right? And so we drove all up and down this path. And I didn't know Pasadena had like a really bad area, like sure. you know, serious gangbanger stuff. So driving along, we found my car and it had the T-tops off and it had the tires off. And and so me, me and my this, this guy were sitting in the park a lot trying to figure out how to, um, you know, get the car back, whatever. I'm like, I gotta think of something. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, <laughs> police floodlights are in our eyes. And what are you guys doing? You guys homos? You know, what are you doing in this parking lot? You know, it's three o'clock in the morning. No, dude. You know, yeah. you know, I just found my car. You better get your car and get out of here. So, <laughs> so I found a pair of pliers, and uh, we, that's how I started my car. Because they ripped out the ignition, you started yeah. with a pair of pliers. And I drove, I drove that car for like probably two years, because I was broke, you know, making my way and started my car. So when I, I've been married for 26 years, so when I first started dating my, my uh, gonna be my wife, my, my girlfriend, I go, hi, how are you doing? Just kind of nonchalantly start the car with a pair of pliers. It's like, where is your key? Oh, it's in there. You didn't turn the key. Uh, it, well, I, I, it's, and then she was a fraud investigator for Farmers Insurance, so she's about to report me. <laughs> I got my car back, so. But that's, so that the whole thing of, you know, 
auditioning and do, you know, I remember that first audition after Nightmare on Elm Street, I was, uh, I was actually, um, I read for this commercial and the cast director goes, hey, so uh, you got a day job? And I said, yeah, I said, I work for this, uh, I said, I'll wait till I work for this test laboratory. I, I write code for um, test scripts for consumer products. She goes, God, you probably should keep that job. And I'm like, and, and I, I, this is literally what she said. And I walked outside going, oh, she, yeah, well, thank you. I'm like, wait a minute, she just freaking insulted me. Yeah. And that just pissed me off. And, I, and if you don't know who I, what kind of person I am, if you tell me no, or I can't do something, I'm gonna figure out a way to, to win. I'm gonna figure out a way. So I was in football. I walked, you know, I walked on a Division One school, became, you know, preseason All American, all stuff. Then ended up with the Dallas Cowboys. And I mean, just tell me no, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure out a way to win. And that's how it is with act, is acting as well. I mean, I started out, you know, I, who am I? I mean, I, I remember giving speeches in class, scared shitless. Yes. Because I, I was afraid to get in front of people. And now, look at, I'm talking in front of you guys, and yeah. I'm having a great time. And just. The same thing as an actor. I wanted to be. I didn't want to be a celebrity. I don't. I just wanted to be an actor. And on my mirror in, in my bedroom in my crappy apartment in Hollywood, it said Michael Bailey Smith, Hollywood's new leading man. I know. And I had hair back. If you look at some pictures on the internet, when I had hair, I was kind of good looking. But um, and so that was my goal. But being six four and two hundred seventy five pounds, and you know, I'm not going to be. You know, there was only one Schwarzenegger back then, right? So I wasn't going to be that. So I kept landing the bad guy roles and I slicked my hair back and then that was like for the first 10 years and then the last, you know, last 16 or 17 years when I did Charmed, uh, that they asked me to shave my head and then from there it was like, I went from cast directors going, well, you know, you're kind of too nice looking to play a bad guy even though you, you could play it, you know, we're gonna, you know, and then when I shaved my head, light flipped on for the bad guys and then, uh, you know, I could, I could not not get hired. I was hired for everything. And speaking of, you know, bad guys, what does it kind of take to portray a good villain, a good bad guy? Yeah, so the secret is, for me, it's always been to always uh, pretend, or not pretend, but to believe that what you're doing is the right thing. Yeah. Because if you try to play bad guys, you're playing a character of it. Mm -hmm. To really believe in what you're doing is the right thing, that you have a mission and you have to complete this mission. And if you look at any you know those bad dictators in history do you, they don't think they're doing bad things they think they're doing the right thing for whatever mission like for their you know country or whatever it is right Pol Pot and those guys like that you know and uh, those guys are wiping millions of people away but they thought they were doing the right thing as sick as they were so yeah, that is the best way to be a villain yeah to, to believe that you're doing the right thing and that's and it was always and that's how I always I always did it, you know. You're doing it for your cause. Agreed. Yeah. Right? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. I mean, also, look at look at all of our, our films, our Freddies. Um, <clears throat> the ones that, that speak, at least, you know, our Wishmaster, they all have their own agenda, and they all yeah. believe in what they're doing. That's it. <laughs> right? Exactly. Right? So I do a tremendous amount of writing now. So I've written a ton of screenplays. I just said one option, which is going to start in being, it's going to be shot in Detroit next year. Very cool. It's very, very exciting. Cool. It's called... My Good Boy. Uh, it's not a horror film, but okay. it could be. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but it's, uh, it's really cool. It's a, it's a bit semi-autobiographical. I changed a lot of it. Um, and life is never as it is in, you know, on the movie screen. It's more exciting. So it's about a kid being picked on and beat up, and he uses sports to get his respect. Mm -hmm. And he takes that too far um, to where it becomes a lake breaker for a loan shark. And he tries to get out of it. And, it's, and so... He does get out of it, and then later on, his kid is being picked on and beat up, and so how does he stop that cycle from continuing? So, yeah. so it's about, it's about, and my mom used to always, you know, say to me, you know, she used to always comb out her, my hair with her fingers and say, my good boy, all the time, so it's kind of cool. Yeah, so that's so exciting, that. yeah. <laughs> that's kind of cool, yeah. So you've had to fill some pretty big shoes. First is the Super Freddy. I mean, Robert England shoes can't get bigger than that, right? Good old R.E. But also Michael Berryman playing yes. Pluto. How is that, and how did you make that character of Pluto like your own? Well, for that one, I did not watch the first one. Mm -hmm. I was told not to watch it by, uh, for Hills of Eyes, Alex Aja. He, mm -hmm. he said, uh, do not watch. If you watch it, I said, no. She goes, don't. Don't yeah. watch it. I want you to bring in your own stuff. Mm -hmm. You're one of the best bad guys in Hollywood. 
bring in your, your, your creativity. So I did. Um, yeah, and it was fun. And then, then after I finished it, I did watch that. So it's a totally, it's just a different movie. It's some, you know, some things are the same, but it's still a different movie. It's more of an inspired by, which is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree, agreed. And it's definitely, I think, more, holy crap. <laughs> yeah, that trailer scene. Oh, I, yeah. That trailer scene is serious. And so, yeah. and I liked what I liked about that character was he was, he, he, I think he's a victim of his own environment. I mean, if he would have been yeah. raised by a nice family, he might have been just a nice little, you know, nice little guy. A little creepy looking, but, sure. but he was in a family of cannibals, so he likes eating people. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah, um, it was fun to play a character who was like these huge fits of rage, but then just a little innocent guy, which I like. I'm kind of like that, so. so. <laughs> and of all your all your movies you've been a part of or shows, you know, what were some of the most challenging scenes for you to do or challenging films or projects? Hmm. Well, I love, I've always liked physicality, uh, you know, being in the military, playing football, things like that. It's funny because a lot of, People like when I did Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and I played a character named Toth. They hired a stunt guy for me for the fight scene. I'm like, dude, I think I yeah. do fight scenes, you know. Yeah. And, and these people just didn't know. And I said, and I went to him. I said, listen, let me do, let me just show you in rehearsal. And if I, if, I, if I'm terrible, then you can go ahead and do it. Mm. And I did one rehearsal. They're like, yeah, you can do it. So <laughs> I, I trained, you know, in martial arts and Muay Thai and and, and you know, uh, ground fighting as well as you know. Um, and kickboxing and a bunch of different things, Jeet Kune Do and stuff. So, but I was always, I was trained to make it look good, you know, it's always for movie fighting. Uh, and so, um, yeah, so I, it was just naturally, I love doing those things, but hmm, the most challenging, I think, you know, when you're a big guy, you, they expect you to ride a motorcycle. So uh, I've had played two roles where I had to ride a motorcycle. One was uh, Nash Bridges, I had a recurring character on Nash Bridges where I played this motorcycle cop thing, a motorcycle cop named uh, Mike Willis from Traffic. That's who I am. <laughs> How are you doing? So I kind of like that character and uh, kind of over the top. And uh, and then the other one was a movie uh, I did with um, Emma Roberts when she was little. It's called uh, Spy Mates. So you know the Airbud movies. Yeah. The same producers of that, but there's a spy who's partners with a chimpanzee, and then I'm the right hand man to Richard Kind. Uh, and I uh, had a like white eye with a scar through it, that typical thing. And so, but I had to ride a motorcycle through uh, downtown uh, Tokyo, flying whoosh, through the traffic, and a background person just happens to get lost and walks right in front of me. And I cranked, instead of doing the back brakes, I did the front brakes and whoosh, over the top, and going like pretty, a good clip. And I hit, hit my head on the pavement, bam, and it bounced up, and then, um, and then uh, but I had a full leather, leather suit, and it didn't get hurt. It cracked the helmet, and but I was fine. Yeah, so, that helmet did its job. It yeah. did. So thank so, God for helmets. Wear your helmet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? That's the moral. Right? <laughs> Ooh. Great. So yeah. yeah. So but I think mo motorcycle is probably the most challenging thing. Yeah. But uh, character-wise, I don't. You know, I've always just sunk myself into every character I play. You know, TV shows to whatever. Um, yeah, I think the hardest thing is sometimes coming onto a sitcom. I've done tons of sitcoms, uh -huh. always playing the comic foil, you know, and then they, these people are established and you walk in <laughs> as a new guy. And you'll get some sitcoms where they're welcoming, they hug you, and, you know, because they believe that you can come make your, make your show better, and other ones almost feel threatened, you know, sure. a little bit, and they don't treat you very nicely. So sure. that's a little disappointing. Do you have a favorite sitcom that you have worked on? Family Matters. Yeah. I did that. I got to fight Urkel. So I, 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 I like, and uh, you know, another one's Wings. I love Wings. Yeah. So I did Wings, uh, and uh, I, I play a, a character named Jaffra. Uh, Jaffra. Jaffra. You know, I come in there and I, I had the old accent with the goatee I had, and uh, they were really welcoming. Yeah, and, that's really nice. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then uh, my first sitcom was uh, Murphy Brown. Mm -hmm. okay. I played, a, you know, they always had a, if you don't remember, if you're younger, you might not know, but she had a series of secretaries mm -hmm. and I was secretary number 73. And that was my first time I was, it was from a live audience. I was scared shitless, mm -hmm. but, but uh, they, one of the series writers got sick. So that because I did a pretty good job, they added an extra scene for me. So it was really cool. Oh, that's they don't, awesome. they don't do, normally don't do that.
That's really nice. Yeah. Do you have a, a, a process that you typically do to prepare for roles? What do you what do you do when you get a role? Well, I have to tell you that on the audition side, mm -hmm. I prepare as well. I dress the part as much as I can. I did um, what's that? Uh, shoot, uh, it's the I think it's Showtime. Uh, Shameless. Shameless. Thank you. Thank you for that. Shameless. I, I, I was in an insane asylum. I wore a dress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. nice. Guess what I wore on the Warner Brothers lot? Black boots, and, a, and I took my wife's slip and wore it. Now, she's a lot smaller than me, but I wore that. A purple slip I wore on Warner Brothers. Talk about my bald head, the way I look, wearing black boots and a slip, going through security. I'm like, sure they've seen it all, though. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Hey, come on. So, you know where you're at, right? Yeah. So when I walk in, they put, you can read, but you already got the part. You have the balls to freaking do that. But but I've seen other actors walk in just wearing no no matter what role the shorts and a tank top or shorts and a t-shirt. Dude, it calls for a black guy, you know, a bad guy in black, you know. And so you know, dress the part, right? And so this, when I prepare for characters, you know, um, wardrobe is always important for me. And then the way they handle themselves physically, that's always a part. And then from there, yeah, I get all that. And then I work on that character. Because to me, what I wear, the way he walks, kind of the way he talks, that all leads me into how I'm gonna play my character. And that's what, like with Charmed, you know, I did uh, Belthazor, I did Janor first. So I did Janor first on Hollowell's Eve. Um, and then I did, I guess, a pretty good job. I said, hey, we want you to play this character named Belthazor. And that led me to play you know, Source and, and Shax. But each one, I, I first approached them in a way of the way they're gonna the walk, talk. Like with Shax, he's kind of the, the demon of wind and tornadoes. And so I made him like if he, you know, moving like with Tai Chi, you know, really fluid. And the way he talks is like Jim Morrison, uh, the end, you know, that kind of, that kind of situation. So a lot of what the voice and things like that, so. And you know, throughout your time in the industry and working, you know, what are some important things you've learned along the way? So at the beginning, everything was super personal. I mean, I I wouldn't get part of it crying. My wife's going, "You're like this big dude. Why are you being a big baby?" You know. But I learned that um, that your your job is you know, getting through the first gate is the audition process and whatever how many auditions you have to do to get it. But each time knowing you're planting a seed, you know, and I, and that's paid off. Uh, well, I did a pilot uh, in 2015, I did a pilot for Amazon called Cocked. It was two gun companies that were buying uh, against each other and I put, they, and I got this role, it was a great role, recurring character. Uh, this series didn't get picked up, but a uh, bad guy, he's like a hitman. And I remember on the first day, I, uh, I show up, it was downtown Los Angeles and we were filming in this big high story uh, business building, which is like the 50th floor, and the PA says, hey, uh, the director wants to talk to you. So I I went went up to the 50th floor, and the director said, goes, hey, Michael, come here for a minute. I said, hey, he says, I said, first of all, I, I appreciate you, you know, hiring me. I, you know, I'm blessed to be on the show. And he goes, oh, no, you're great. Do you know why I hired you? I said, well, I hope it's because I did a good job in the audition. He goes, well, yeah, that too, but you don't understand that five years ago, you read me, read for me on a Burger King commercial. I wanted to hire you, the producers for, I mean, the, the product people at for Burger King didn't want you, but I told myself, I'm gonna find a role for this dude. Uh -huh. And here you are. So I said, well, thanks. So it's planting seeds. Yeah. It's all about mm -hmm. planting seeds and setting a reputation. When I, I also am in sales now, and I head up all uh, sales worldwide for this uh, company called Lexi. And, uh, and it's all about planting seeds, the same thing. You know, it's all about, and people getting to, to know you, remember you, I, in sales, I use all. I don't use Michael Smith. I use Michael Bailey Smith. So it's become like a brand, right? So that helps me at the sales side. So that's that's one of my important things. I think in, uh, is to when you're done with your audition, you walk away, let it go. It's out of your hands. You can't do anything else. You know, if you do, it's then you become desperate. And just know that you planted a good seed and do the best job. And my key, and a secret in there, is that a lot of people just like. When I started, like in the, in the early 90s, there's all these big bodybuilder guys that started at the same time as me. They all went away within a few years because they didn't think they had to train or take it seriously. 
And so I would, I would study, and my secret weapon was that I'd always find either an actress, I would never have a, I would never go see a guy, I would always see a girl, because there was a competition, and I'd, or go to my acting coach, and I would go see them before I'd go audition. So I'd work the scene, work the character, I'd come in hot and freaking nail it every time. Most people book like one out of 50 or one out of 100 auditions. Mine was like six out of 10. I was just booking all the time. I've done 60 films, 100 episodes of television, tons of commercials, video games, print work, voiceover. I made a good living out of it for you know, 26, 27 years, so a long time. And like, how do you find how do you find that kind of balance? You know, doing all those different things, like work life balance. How do you do that? Um, well, I have a it's, tough time with that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I have a tough time with that. I I, I become uh, obsessed with that. Like when I'm writing, I could lock myself in my, my office and turn the lights off and stare in, in my computer, my, uh, my screen for, I'll, I'll look up and it's eight hours later and I don't even know. I'm just so, you know, same thing. Uh, like when I first started in, in 19, I, I basically had this an agent and, uh, and what I would do in the mornings, I would meet them at six o'clock in the morning and they'd hand me a whole basket full of envelopes and their submissions, right? Back in the day, they, now it's all electronically done, but you have these middle envelopes that had all these photos of, with resumes out of all these people for roles. I'd go around Hollywood dumping off these submissions to all these uh, casting offices every day. Did it five days a week, every day. That's what I did. I just hustled, hustled, hustled. I did everything possible. I did, I did plays, I did uh, everything. I did went to UCLA and USC and signed up for their um, their, uh, to be an actor in their student films. I did all that stuff. I just hustled. And that's people come up to me now and ask me, you know, how did you start in business? What do you think I should do? And things like that. And I tell them, you just need to take whatever part you can get as long as it's not going to compromise your morals. Sure, yeah. yeah. And study. Take it seriously. Study the craft. Agreed. Because studying you use as a network. I, uh, I've, I've helped like four or five people so far get into the business and are now working actors. So I've, I've, I've got them connected. And I said, the first thing you do when you get there is first, if you want to be an actor in Hollywood, I mean, film and television, you have to go to Los Angeles just to get going, right? You can go to Georgia, Atlanta, anywhere else later, but you need to get there. I said, first thing you do is get a job and, and, a, and a nice place to stay. A place to stay that's got to be nice enough to where it's safe, right? And where then, you'll survive. Yes, yes. Right, agreed. And then from there, you got to have yourself a car that works, mm -hmm. that's dependable. It could be the dinkiest little car as long as it starts every, you know, starts and gets going. Those are the things to do, and because you need to support yourself. And there was this uh, person that told me once that even though you might not be successful or you might might not be rich or act like you are, don't spend like you are, but look like you are. Dress, dress nice, have a, have a decent car, try to make your apartment as nice as possible because you know with that crappy audition, you come home, you wanna come home to a crappy audition, I mean, a crappy apartment, a nice apartment, you know. Find yourself a cat or a dog as well, something that, you know, whatever you're by yourself, uh, do those things and that's what I did. Um, and I always made sure that I carried myself as being hugely successful because when you walk in, they, they uh, cast a director, producer, director, they want you, because you're coming in there, it's first treated like a job, it's professional. Some people have come in like thinking it's a joke or it's a game, I'm doing this part-time. No, freaking it's a serious business. There's millions of dollars you know, riding on this. So walk in like it's a job, professional, come in, say, you know, uh, nice meeting you, whatever, and then freaking kick the shit out of that audition. Yeah. You want to be so good, they go, holy crap, I like this guy. <laughs> I, I did an audition for this movie called Monster Man. It's hard to find. I play a character named, can I say it better? Fuckface. Yes. yes. <laughs> great, great, great character. Find the film, it's great. Michael Davis is director. I walked in, I come up with a really cool walk, and it. I can smell you. Like, kind of like that kind of interesting uh, way he talks and stuff like that. I don't finish the audition, and he got up and he just hugged me. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, I don't need to see anybody else. You're, and that's what you want. Maybe yeah. you're not probably gonna get the hug, but you know, you want them to go walk on and go, holy shit. I read for, um, I was doing Undisputed with Bing Rains, Wesley Snipes in Vegas. And I had a couple days off, my manager called me, hey, they want you to read for Scorpion King. The, the oh. you know, the whatever, the, oh, yeah. the rock, the first breakout rock. So, um, and so, so I hopped in the car, drove four hours from Vegas to Los Angeles, went to Universal. 
I read, and when I got done reading, uh, they said, don't go anywhere. So they brought the rock in, and he, he, he was there with me, and they brought in some other producers. I read again, and I said, okay, thanks. And I got out, got in the car, I was like, I think I did a good for job, you know, I think I'm very good at not knowing. I had to drive back to Vegas, so I get back on the 101, and if you know anything about the 101, it's freaking crazy, it packed, is. especially <laughs> in the afternoon. And it's packed, I'm going like two miles an hour, and this guy get, come pulls up to next to me, he goes, hey, Romani window. I said, hey, dude. He goes, he yells at me, he goes, hey, dude, I was in the audition after you, and they're freaking still talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm like, dude, I think that's good. So. I didn't get, end up getting a role because what happened, from what I understand, because I went back to went back to the set on Undisputed, and uh, makeup artist goes, "Hey, congratulations!" I said, oh, "What?" She goes, "I heard you're gonna be working on uh, Scorpion King," because that a lot of those people were working on that show too. Okay. I'm like, "Oh, thanks." I said, "Wow!" I called my manager. Am I gonna get this? Yeah, they just called for your for your quote and whatever your your dates, and I'm like, "Cool." And then it went away, and I he heard that the director is friends with. Schwarzenegger and he called up Dolph Lundgren and said, hey, I want my boy Dolph Lundgren to be in this film and he got the role instead. So, but hey, that's happened. So. Uh, yeah. You know what? It is what it is. But going to what you said about the audition and impressions and relationships and always putting your best foot forward, the Burger King commercial is the best example of that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Right? Five years later, he's like, I'm going to get him. So remember. Get him. I need him. I need this yeah. guy. Yeah, there's, there's a little film coming out called Miracle Desert. I sh just I, I shot this a couple years ago, uh, I think a year, year and a half ago. Uh, I'm buried in the neck from the neck down. Uh, you can you can Google it, look up Google Miracle Dead. You see the the photo. Uh, it's coming out here shortly. It's a little it's a film short, but it won a ton of awards. That I read for that guy like ten years ago, um, and he remembered me and he goes he calls me hey what are you doing I'm like I'm not working anymore I'm not, I'm a business guy now well you need to be unbusiness yourself and get your ass out to freaking <laughs> Mojave Desert the same thing happened with the, this movie that I just got optioned right yeah. for uh, it's called My Good Boy I did a film for him ten years ago or fifteen years ago whatever it was they uh, guy by the name of David Jeffrey if you look him up he's uh, a producer for Bones uh, uh, Queen of the South uh, Prison Break, tons and tons of films. I was doing a film for him over the summer uh, in, during hiatus, and we were talking. I played a character, um, it was called, the movie's called Girl Number Two, and I, I'm, I'm killing all the sorority chicks, it's awesome. It's a sledgehammer, which is very, very cool. Um, and, uh, and he goes, oh, what, so what do you like, you know, when you're, uh, when you're not acting? So I, 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 you know, I write quite a bit. I love, I love writing and, you know, things like I've written tons of screenplays. And he goes, oh, it's a couple. I pitched him a couple, then like this, like last year he calls me and I'm, walk, right, I'm walking in to, to, you know, talk to a customer. He goes, hey, how you doing? I said, good, I'm kind of busy. Just, hold, <laughs> just a couple minutes, uh, remember that one film you pitched me? I said, yeah, I want to do it. And I'm like, all right, you sure? I said, yeah, I said, send me the script. So that's kind of how it starts. Wow. You're planting seeds, right? Yeah. That's all you're doing. And building relationships. Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. of course. Yes. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Go on and on, hopefully. Do we have any questions from anybody? Yes, sir. Uh, I was wondering, uh, for Charm, for Balthazar, was, whose decision was it to make him look like a roided out uh, Darth Maul? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, it just kind of came like that. It actually was it was originally a stunt guy that was going to do that role. Mm -hmm. And then they decided they needed an actor, and then they when they saw me doing All Hollow's, All, All Hollowell's Eve, and then saw me very stoic and very kind of Terminator-esque. Um, you know, they said, hey, do you want to do this? I said, yeah, so that was cool. I mean, doing that show, I mean, working with the three gals, Alyssa Milano and Holly Marie Combs and Shannon Doherty, all of them great ladies. I know there's been some things said about her, Shannon Doherty, but she's actually, a lot of that's blown out of proportion. Yeah. Trust me, I was I was telling this on a podcast just a couple weeks ago, uh, we, were on the, we were doing a, sh a scene and she was in it, and, and we were in the shade and uh, underneath the video village area. And the PA comes up, oh, Shannon, you just got some flowers. I'm just waiting for some flowers. So it's like a big old, you know, long box of long roses. She opens up, and they're like dead roses. I'm like, who, who would do that? Why would they do that? So, um, I, you know, that's like that. But she works her butt off. I saw her, like, uh, um, while we were doing the scene, she was off working with stunt, uh, stunt guys on a martial arts scene she was doing. She works her butt off, and you know, Alyssa, super nice. Um, she would always like when she would come on the set in the morning because 
Me, it took me about three and a half hours or four hours to get me to look like Beltazor. And then when I did this, the, the times when I was in the waist up, that's like a five hour to almost six hour scene. Wow. And she would come up and, and see me and kiss me on the cheek. You're not scary, you know, kiss me. I think she's kind of saying that to herself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 She, but, was she doing better her health-wise? Health what, Shannon? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think so. She's still fighting it, but yeah, I agree. One time, uh, when I was doing it from the waist up, uh, that's because it took so long, we shot to like, I don't know, almost midnight, and they wanted me back on the set like at six in the morning. And so to get me out of that would take probably two hours, take it all off, and she, they, they said, hey, would you mind going home with it on? <laughs> and I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, so it was like right around, it was, so we're, it was in Sherman Oaks, so it was right around, it was Hotel. before Halloween, I'm in my car, and it's like it's about 11 o'clock at night, I'm going home, I pull up an intersection, and these, like, these dudes look at me going, hey, dude, that's some serious shit, man, it's not even freaking Halloween yet, and I, you know, and I had this, you know, the ears and the piece, and I, I took the teeth out, of course, I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah whatever, dude, no, it's cool, you know, whatever, I'm like, and then I get home, and my son's like, my older son's at the time, uh, He's like four or five, you know, they're mama's boys then. And I was gone all the time. So now it's looking for me as a dad, because you'd be, I would be traveling all over. One time I did, I did back to back to back. I was gone for six months straight. I went from Bangkok to, I was to Bulgaria and somewhere else. I came home, my kid didn't know who I was. And I was like, oh my gosh, this was terrible. And so uh, I remember um, when I came home with Belfazor, I was like, I told my wife before I said, I'm coming home, she's going, Oh, Hollywood, gosh, <laughs> you know, she's, she's not a Hollywood gal at all, so, um, and uh, I came home and she was giving him a bath, it was kind of late, I, he, was, he had got something, I don't know, but uh, he pooped his pants or something, can't say that, now he's an army ranger, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, uh, but uh, when he saw me, I became like the biggest toy for him, it was awesome, yeah. like, so we were like, you know, it was pretty cool, so, yeah, good stuff. Any other questions out there? Yeah. Um, I noticed you uh, worked on Star Trek Voyager yes. as alien number one yes. uh, when they're all stranded on that uh, planet. So yes. uh, what was uh, shooting that episode like? It was great. Uh, yeah, I played uh, the Neanderthals. Uh, so as a part, uh, I played in the, the cliffhanger and then the, the next one for the next season. So both of those. And uh, um, so the, the crew gets beamed down to the planet because they, uh, they got taken over by some other alien, the, their starship did. And so down there, they're waiting, you know, we're down there, of course, minding our business, and here comes these Starfleet people, and so, you know, we get in a bit of a fight and whatever. Uh, I get killed off that, I think I get stabbed in the chest or something like that, but it's, uh, it was cool, it was great. And we shot it at Needles in California, like a really prehistoric, prehistoric looking area. The funny thing about, I have so many crazy stories, so the funny thing is, so, you know, they're really good at the makeup effects. They have a room like this with just chairs and chairs and chairs, and you have a whole Neanderthal people they have to build up, and besides the Star Trek, you know, cast. And they get that done. We, we shoved us all in this big van, and we're going, and they put us up at this, like, motel, like, off the middle of the boonies. Well, we, we drove by it, and one of the guys who was a stunt guy on it, he wasn't the actor, but he wanted a stunt guy, he goes, hey, I forgot something. Can I, let me go back, can we go to a hotel and, and grab this thing? He's dressed as that Neanderthal dude, right? <laughs> and uh, and so we stop, he gets out, runs in, and when he opens up his door, guess who's in there? It's the, the cleaning lady. <laughs> and they're, you know, a Mexican lady, right? And in Mexican foreclosed, the thing called chupacabras, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. The, yeah. the goat sucker. Yeah, so she comes throwing chupacabras, yeah. <laughs> jumping out and running in, and you know, so we're all in the van laughing our asses off, so it was pretty funny. Yeah. So, you know, that's what happened like in, um, when I was doing Undisputed, I was Aryan Brotherhood gang leader, I had ABs, I had a beautiful swastika, I had SS's, and I was sleeved, everything. They put us up at Caesar's Palace, up there for two months. What am I, I can't walk around looking like that, I'd be in trouble. Yeah. And so I had to wear a high collared shirt and I wore a, like a beanie over my, you know, my head and uh, did that, but, and, but I had to, of course I'd always have to wear a tank top to show off my, you know, my physique, you know, cause I'm the, the bad guy. And uh, 
So uh, I would go to this, I walk about like a, a half an hour, 45 minutes to this gym and work out. And it was getting kind of hot. And uh, so in the middle of the workout, I took my beanie off. I'm like, wipe my brow. I'm like, oh, oh shit, oh. put it back on. <laughs> Didn't think about it. So then a little bit later, I walk outside, two Vegas PD car pull up, hook me up against the hood, handcuff me, and the dude's got a club. Bam! Jack and my kids, and he's going, what school do you go to? What school do you go to? I'm like, uh, Eastern Michigan? No, asshole. What prison? I didn't know. <laughs> and so, um, so yeah, so he, like, I told him, no, I'm like, this with my hand behind my back, going, no, officer, I'm doing a film with Bing Rams, what, no, you're that bullshit, like, I am. And I goes, I play the, you know, da, 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 da. And he says, just scrape off one of the things you'll see. And he scraped off the, the A on one of my hands, right? And he let me go and got my face, a little short cough, got my face. And he goes, you know, you cover your colors in Vegas, man. I'm, I, I, you know, I got you, man. I'm like, whatever. So <laughs> next day I get to the set and the makeup artist is going, what happened to your hand? Because normally you put these on, they last for like at least two, three weeks, oh, right? Yeah, sure. And this, you know, and it's not, you know, so if you put it back on, and I told her the story. So then later on, Walter Hill, Walter Hill is a director. He did like 48 Hours and a bunch of films, really yeah, famous. Yeah. He walks up and he goes, hey, Michael, so... Uh, uh, <laughs> you getting into trouble? Yeah, he's, he's like, hey, so I hear you ran a little bit of trouble downtown. I'm like, oh, yeah, I almost got arrested. He goes, you know what? That's good casting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> what they give you some sort of like ID cards? Like, no, they don't do that. No, really? no, I, no, uh, no. Uh, when I was doing Hills of, Hills of Eyes, we're in Morocco, yeah, and, yeah. and Morazizat, which is like the most south, southern part of Morocco you can get okay. next to the Sahara Desert, and it's where they film like Gladiator and all these other, like, kind of those kind of movies. And I'm in a, uh, we had to go at the opening scene of Hills of Eyes, is where we're killing the, the, the two, uh, the two uh, what do you call it, the, the two miners, right? Mm -hmm. I'm killed, throwing them around with the axe or whatever. So that's a ways away from where we're doing the main shooting at. So they threw me in this car like a little uh, like a little Toyota truck I'm in the front seat this Moroccan driver's next to us and and then we're going and and it's literally it's like if you opened up the Bible and the uh, pictorial of the Bible it have these pictures of back this is what it looks like it's like mud huts and it's you know sheep herds with the people with the cloaks and the staffs it's like Moses and it's freaking awesome and so here comes a sheep herd, you know, a herd of sheep coming by, and there's the, the shepherds are coming by with their staffs, and we had to stop, and we're like we're getting shrouded by, surrounded by the sheep. Well, here comes this, the the herder, the sheep herder. He's like, he look, he looks in there, sees me in the front seat. I'm dressed like freaking Pluto. <laughs> yeah. He throws his staff up, just freaking running in the hood, wood, woods. It was pretty. I mean, not the woods, but the hills. So it was pretty crazy. Yeah, it was pretty great. And, I, and I've been. Um, when I did Undisputed, or when I did uh, Best of the Best Three, um, I played a, I played a lot of Aaron like white supremacist dudes. Um, it's good casting. I know, <laughs> good, good, good. right? Yeah. But we shot that in Bedford, Indiana. Okay. Bedford, Indiana is where the Ku Klux Klan dragon supposedly was born, and that a lot of that stuff started. And it's a lot of that was the first time ever I've seen straight up hardcore, holy shit, racism. Yeah. I mean, just bad. Mm -hmm. Me and I befriended this one cat, uh, crew crew guy, a black guy. We said, hey, let's, let's go to the gym. He was worked out too. We went, we went to the gym, this off, off hold the wall gym, and we went in there. I said, hey, I want to work out. Great. And the guy goes, you can come in, but that black boy ain't going in here. I'm like, what? I, I almost had to go. I was coming over the counter to whip on this guy's ass. Yeah. But when we filmed this one scene in Best of the Best Three, it was in this rock quarry, and they had all these uh, background people from the local area. Uh, on top of the rock quarry, and we're down below, and we kill. And the part of the movie is we kill this black priest. And it's with Mark Ralston, great actor. So yeah. he's he's my uh, I'm the right hand man. And so, uh, which I play quite a bit, why the right hand man's. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, we get done killing him, and then he goes, "What say you?" And I'll go, "White power." What say you? White power. And I'm like, "Okay, we're done." Like, okay, come, we're going to lunch. So we're going to lunch, and here are a couple background guys going, "Hey, man." My power man, I got you. Oh, I'm like, God. I go, no, uh, hey, no, no, hold on, no. <laughs> yeah. I write a script check. I'm acting, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not acting. real. Yeah, yeah. I've, yeah. Been, I've, been, uh, I've, been, uh, I've been mistaken for police officers. Like, oh, officer, I need your help. I'm like, no, that's the I, guy. I can see that. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, it's been crazy. Yeah. Good stuff. Any other audience questions out there? I got a small one. When you're, when you're 
reading the scripts and trying to memorize them, do you have to memorize the scripts word for word? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, uh, only um, in television, eight different ones. So television, sitcoms especially, and sitcoms, because I've done soap operas too, you have to be word for word. You cannot deviate wow. whatsoever. It, they time that to the second. So that those words, and same thing with theater. Theater is to the yeah. goal the same do way. They, do they have like some sort of teleprompter? They have, they have person that times the scenes. They have a stopwatch. Well, they might do something more fancier now, but they do everything. <laughs> but they do, it's, it's all, it's timed perfectly. Because they all, they all just shoot so much. They have commercial breaks and all that stuff. It's time. Right. You cannot deviate. And they will check you. In a, you didn't say it like this. You got to say it like that. Whatever. It's got to be, it's on. Then uh, episodics still on the, because pretty much, but they have a little bit more leeway there when you get to the film, um, depending on who you are, I guess. You know, you can have some, but for me, I just want to, I respect the writer, and I just want to say how it is. There's, I know it's kind of weird, but there's just the way I believe. I, I don't say, like, I, when I see the word God damn it, I don't say that. So I'll figure some other way to say it without that. Well, that's I, what I mean, like, change it just a slightly. Yeah, so for me, it's like personal things like that. Sure. Yeah, I don't get to say that, you know. Even, like, when we do the, we did the, uh, 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 Undisputed, I had to go to Green, green Range, okay. Hey, yo, in person. Yeah, right. And I'm like, I said, you, he goes, no, it's cool. I said, you're not going to hurt me, are you? <laughs> and we end up cutting that. So I, you don't need to do that sometimes. You know, so. Yeah. yeah. So you've done so many different types of things. Is there anything that you haven't done yet or any kind of project or skill or something that you haven't done and you really want to try? Oh, I just say haven't done. I would say porn, but haven't want to try. No. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, I've been very fortunate to have, and I've done, I haven't done a music video, I don't think so. I've been asked to, but I've not done oh. a music video. I've done that. Uh, no, I've done, I've done video games. I was just showing uh, one of the guys at my table, I did uh, Fight Night, I played this Aryan brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, but but the, 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 that dialogue was really good, so yeah. it was really cool. Make Broadway plays. I've done I've done theater. Um, and I've done a movie, a, a one really cool uh, play called Doing Judy. It's about a bunch of Judy Garland impersonators, uh -huh. and there's like and they and then they each one gets on getting killed killed off, and they're trying to find out who their murderer murderers. And I play a drag queen, oh. and I have never done that. And I and I have to tell you, and you know, I used to be you know you playing football back in the you know eighties. I'm, I'm I was a bit homophobic, you know. I just was because I didn't know. Um, working with 99% of the cast of being gay, I freaking awesome, Ooh. awesome. I, I was so just so enlightened by everything, and it, and, uh, and the, the cast was great. The cast, actors are phenomenal, and I played this drag queen, and I loved it. I, I had pumps, I had the hair, I had the, the skirt, and I had so many offers for dates it's after. Like, it's like, yeah. Was it like freeing, like woo? It was a little, yes, but I, but they also told me I was the biggest and ugliest drag queen they ever saw. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't buy that person. No, no I, I just see pictures, so that was pretty cool, but yeah. Thank you. Cool. That, that, was, that was fun, yeah, it was good. Yeah, well, I mean, okay, so like, the great thing about drag is that Anybody can do it. Doesn't matter what your body type is, what you look like. You just gotta know it and love it and do it. I did. My, my <laughs> wife came to it and <laughs> she, she, you, you would not make a good woman. <laughs> so it's pretty cool. My wife's pretty accomplished. She's a my wife is a uh, ranked uh, CrossFit. Yeah, she's wow. yeah. So she she was an uh, all American softball player. Wanted to get a national championship ring and then she turned it into a CrossFit. So she. She makes me look like, you know, a couple art compared to her. So you guys can go work out together. No, she, she does something totally different. I just went to the gym. She, her workouts, if you've seen CrossFit workouts, yeah. it's like yeah. it's like torture. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're like, I just get the gym. She. Yeah. And, then, and then I have two sons, both playing college football right now, which wow. is great. So one's playing at a junior college in College of the Canyons, and where I used to live in Santa Cruz, California. The other one's a starting quarterback, not starting quarterback, he's a quarterback at Central Michigan. He's a guy who was the Army Ranger. Mm -hmm. So every weekend, I'm going one way and my wife's going the other way. So uh -huh. this weekend they're both off, so I could do this. Then uh, next weekend we're both in uh, Los. Um, no, on Friday I'll be in Central Michigan watching my son play 
uh, on on Friday, national nationally televised. And then the next day we'll be in California watching my son and my younger son in a playoff game. Oh, that's so, exciting. Oh, you must be so proud. It's fun. It's fun watching it, yeah. So it's still nerve-wracking, you know, as a parent. Not just yeah. probably want to see them be successful, right? So that's what we want. Right. right. So um, do you have a favorite memory on from a set? Any any movie, any show, favorite memory? Um, let's see. I have, there's tremendous things that I've, I've yeah. experienced and worked with. I remember I was doing that uh, that uh, Spy Mate movie, and it was filmed in Hemlock, which is in uh, outside of Vancouver. And Hemlock is where areas where they uh, some of um, uh, First Blood, the Rambo movies were filmed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember I had, they taught me to write a solo bill. I wrote a solo bill for two weeks. It was freaking awesome. Mm -hmm. And I we had time, so I drove the solo bill on top of top mountain top. And I could see, like, not the curvature of the earth, but pretty darn close. And I made a call and talked to my wife on top of this mountain. It was freaking awesome. It was snowing. It was pretty cool. I've been to Jamaica uh, filming there. I got to work with a chimpanzee. That's scary because they're 10 times stronger than you. Uh, and you don't mess around with them. And they'll, they'll mess with you. They'll, they'll, like, they'll look at you and just put their mouth on your arm. And you think called a pressure bite. And it's like, just look at you go, when are you going to pull your arm, bitch? I'm ready. And they'll try to test you. And so you have to, you know, but. They're very, uh, they're very um, id oriented. They're it's all about eating, sleeping, and uh -huh. sex. Uh -huh. and it's all about who's ever the biggest is the toughest. Yeah. And so I'm a big dude, so he respected me. Sure. But the female that was in the uh, uh, actress, he was trying to mount her like the whole damn time during the <laughs> oh you know the filming. And you know, smaller guys, he would try to dominate. So it was pretty crazy. And they have such human like expressions and yeah there's a scene if you look up uh spy mate on youtube there's a couple scenes there's a couple and it's really cool um where i get he throws a coconut on me and drop hit, hits me and knocks me out and then i wake up and he's looking at me and i think he's this hula dancer and like we're both dancing back and forth <laughs> so it was pretty pretty cool yeah and so um who are some people who have inspired you the most in your life sheesh uh that was crazy to say, uh, Lou Ferrigno and Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, at the beginning, when I saw uh, Conan the Barbarian, um, just seeing Schwarzenegger, and then Lou Ferrigno just because he was always like, seemed like the underdog, and I always liked him. And plus, for, he was in The, the Hulk, right? In TV show Hulk. And if you remember, and I didn't, real, I didn't realize by the time, he would turn in The Hulk 20 after, and, and then 10 till in the hour. And so I would be at a college what? party. It, it, it's time. That's how it was. It's all time. I, I, I knew this. So 20 after and, and 10 till. If you could do time by watch. So when I would be at a part of college party, I would be like at 9, 9, 20, whatever. I'm like, I'm like, excuse me for a minute. I'd find the TV in the house, in the, whatever, the fraternity or the sorority house or whatever, turn it on and watch when he turned the hall. And that's what I wanted to be like. I wanted to, I wanted to be that big. Um, so those people, you know, without them knowing it, that was inspirational. I think my my acting coach, a guy named name Jeremiah Comey, um, he was a person who's um, just said I had you you had you have talent, you could be successful in this business. Um, that helped a lot, and uh, he just you know those people. And then of course I think my my wife allowing me to go off and you know chase my dreams. You know, um, yeah, I think I think that's that pretty much it. And speaking of, you know, pursuing dreams, um, what advice do you kind of have for folks in that process to pursue their dreams? Yeah, well, um, well, it's like anything, you have to have passion about it, no matter what, and you have to be focused. Um, like, I'm gonna say this right now, I know it's crazy to say, but you have to say it if you wanna be successful. I'm, I'm gonna win an Oscar as a writer. I'm 64 right now, I know that's on the back end of life, and I got a lot more years behind me than ahead of me, unless I wait, you know, unless I live to 128, which I'm kind of, yeah. kind of jacked. But <laughs> you never know. my thing is, is that I, that's what I want to do, and I've been working my butt off to become a really great writer and studying about. I still study every day about becoming how to be a better screenwriter, and so um, passion's the, the biggest thing. And then from there is you have to set a goals, right? It's like when I used to coach football. I coached football in California for a long time, high school and youth football. And I never, and I told people 
let's forget about the scoreboard. Let's forget, don't forget about like, you know, the next quarter. Let's, and that's why I remember when I, when I used to play football myself, is just worry about the plays in front of you. Look at the guy in front of you. And like for me, I played the line. What step, what step do you have to take with your foot? What hand do you have to punch with your hand? And how do you put pressure on there? And how do you move this guy out of the way? That's what you have to think about first, the small things first. Don't think about winning. Don't think about the scoreboard. Don't think about all these other things. Do small things first. Because they don't take care of the big things. Right? It's the building blocks. And the same thing, you have a goal. I, I, so whatever, you want to be an actor. Great. So how, how do we get to be an actor? Well, first you got to go and you got you to study the craft. Right? And, it's, and you're not going to be a famous actor or a successful one right off the bat. Rarely does that ever happen with anybody. Totally. All right? So you have to go to acting class. You're going to suck at the beginning. It's okay. Everybody sucks at the beginning, and just and you and you and you feed off that, and you start work, working your craft, and you you join theater, and you do you do uh, small films, you know everything you can do locally, and get good at it, and then from there, um, then you say, okay, what's my next step? My next step is I have to get to Hollywood. I have to get there. It's a scary place. It can be, but you know what? Someone's got to make it. Why not me? And that's what I said to myself all the time. Uh, that dude ain't no, it ain't, I'm just bad, bad, bad language, but ain't no better than me, right? I just, maybe he's better looking than whatever he is, but he ain't more talented than me, and I'm gonna show him. And that's, that's what I did. And so, um, then find a way to get there. Save your money, get to, Holly, get, uh, get to Hollywood, and, and then from there find, like I said, apartment, yeah. job, good car, go to acting class, network your butt off at acting class. That's what I did all the time. I, Get the guy out of class, show them how good you are. And then other people go, hey, you're pretty good. Oh, thanks, I appreciate it. And like, hey, you know, who's your agent? Oh, who's your manager? Oh, you should be open to taking somebody else, whatever. Here's my resume. And then, but how do you build that resume? You go and do uh, student films. You get some tape on yourself. You do all that stuff. Put that stuff together to show people. When you go to audition, casting directors want you to be that person. They don't, they wouldn't waste their time if they didn't want you, right? So have that attitude. You walk in and they go, they want me to be great. So you study your ass off, you get prepared, you go there and freaking knock your socks off. They also have seen how many people, and they're like, another one. Yes. Not To not give your best effort is disrespecting their time. I agree completely. Yeah. And come in there and show them your talent. Everyone's different. I, I, listen, there's, I want to audition. There's 20 other dudes, 30 other dudes that look like me, bald headed, big and muscular, right? So how do I separate myself? It's what it's my my own personal, you know, personality, what I can bring to the character, that flavor I can do, my voice, whatever I do. That's another thing too. When I first started, uh, when I had the hair, hey, how you doing? Good. Yeah, I had like a nice friendly voice. I didn't want to intimidate people and they go, well, you're not a bad guy. So then I learned to walk in as the character. I read for a Christian film and I played, uh, it was, it's called Revelation Road. And I, and I did this one thing and, and uh, I walked in, I'm like, Hey, how you doing? I, I, this is why I, I, hey, how you doing? My name's Michael Bailey Smith. And that's how I, I walk in and I'll shake hands. Very professional, but I'm going to freaking rip your head off. If you look at me one way sideways, you got it. When I got done with the audition, I went, fuck yeah. It's a Christian <laughs> film. And I walked, and, and they hired me because I was the bad guy. Yeah, yeah. I played, you know, I was, I worked for the, the, the you know, the six, six guys. So it was pretty cool. But that's, but that's what you do is you, you take it seriously as a job, you prepare, you plan. And think they always think and every day you do something to push your career forward every day small or big doesn't matter push yourself and always do that set up small goals uh medium and then long term in my end of bed at my end of life i want to and i've said this before first of all i want on the slab when i'm laying there i want the the dude the mortuary guy look at my body and go damn he wore that shit out there's nothing left and not i'm almost all there my shoulders are bad my knees are bad I'm wearing that stuff out. And then if you're fortunate to have to, to be able to think back on your life as you breathe your last moments, not have any regrets. That's, I read from this one guy who's a great inspirational, I forget, keep forgetting his name, but he said, where you will find the greatest inventions, the greatest, uh, the greatest plays, uh, the, gre the greatest of everything will be at the graveyard because people are afraid to take this, take that next step. I told, him, I told my older son, who was an army ranger in a special operations unit called the 75th Ranger Regiment, I told him, I said, listen, 
when you get in the military, everybody, most people, 90% of the guys will do enough to get by. And life's like that too. Everybody wants to get the C, right? Maybe a C plus, but mostly just a C. Why? Don't do the C. Be a B, be a, go shoot for the A, but do the B for sure. But, 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 go, but go for the A. And how do you do that? You freaking do the extra work. You, you, you work hard and you'll see what will happen. People want you to be great. They want you to be great. And, and the military the same way. And so what happened? He, he went in. I said, you're gonna, get, you're gonna get opportunities in life. Either people that wanna sit there and watch it happen or step forward and make it happen. Be the one that steps forward, raise your hand, don't be kissing ass, but step forward and make it happen. So what happens in basic training? Uh, if you don't know, I've been in the military, of course. If you've been in the military, they'll, they'll say, oh, you're, you're, you're not in charge. And they'll fire you like two hours later or whatever, right? And they put the next person on. They put him in charge. He was there from the day, first day to the day they finished uh, basic training. He was the guy in charge. He graduated top of his class in basic training, top of his class in AIT, he went to ranger school, top of his class, everything he did. And now he's doing something even more, you know, incredible, trying to, you know, play division one football, which he hadn't played in four years. And that's, but that's how you have to approach life like that. I see so many people like complain, well, this isn't happening. Well, excuse me, fuck that shit. <laughs> Just freaking get pissed off and go after it. Say, screw it, don't deny me. You're not gonna deny me. I'll figure out a way. It's not even sales. You tell me no, no, I'm sorry, you're not gonna take you? I said, all right. In my head, I'm going, I'll be calling you in about a, about a month or two. Yeah. I'll be calling you, and I do, and guess what? That, that'll happen. I remember one guy, uh, you know, Texas Instruments, you know who yeah. they are, big silicon yeah. manufacturer. Mm -hmm. They told me once, even if you were, back when I was working with a test laboratory, even if you, you were the last test laboratory in the world, I would not test with you. You suck, you're terrible, don't call me again. Okay. Gave it about a month. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> What's going on? Yeah, listen, I don't know what happened in the past, but that's not the past. Let's talk about the future. Let's talk about right now. I said, I want to do whatever it takes to win you as a customer. If I have to freaking send a limo down to go get you, to bring you and show you how good we are, I'll do that. That's what I did. I sent the limo down and got the guy. I, I did, I did, you have to do whatever it takes sometimes to make it happen. And that's how you have to do it when you, you have a goal, you're, you're being, have that passion, man. Do not be denied, period. You have to, you know, it's called grinding, right? You have to grind. Oh. That was inspirational as fuck. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that's true though. I mean, I, I, how many Ubers do I take? I take Uber all around the world. I've been to China a billion, a billion times, like probably 40, 50 times. I've been to China, there's a thing called Didi. I have conversations with people that can barely speak English. I got them freaking motivated. <laughs> I, 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 guys in, in, in uh, the Netherlands, I Uber, Uber works there. All, I was talking to a guy last last night. Went to dinner with some people. Came back in Uber. This guy's from Congo. He moved his family here. They, dude, that guy's gonna be signing up for some stuff here shortly because I got it motivated. I said, you cannot let this moment we're talking about right now will never get it back. It's gone forever. That clock's ticking. You gotta go. I listen. People say, "Oh, you're you know you're 64. You can retire in a couple of years." Screw that. I'm not freaking retiring. I'm riding that baby till the end. Yeah. And that's what you have to do. So. Michael Bailey Smith, motivator. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. We love you. I am. I'm a renewed fan. Like I liked you before. I love you now. Yeah. yeah. Like. Yeah. But I, you know, just being, just being, you know. You know, there's, I have I have much more to accomplish. I'm yeah. I'm very uh, gracious. You know, uh, I'm very appreciative of everything that's you know come my way. But it didn't you know it didn't happen just you know it took time and work right. Mm -hmm. So effort, determination, work. Right. Thank and you, if, sir. And if you want to reach out to me, email me at mbs. My initials at my name, so mbs at michaelbellysmith.com. If you want any advice, anything like this, I want to be you know it'd be good. So just let me know. So all good stuff. You're amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much. You don't even know.